Hi everyone! In this video, we'll be talking about videography or video design. Design Lab is a free resource here on campus to help you better apply design principles to your multimedia projects. At Design Lab, we work from a model called the cat of effective design. I don't mean this kind of cat. But rather, when evaluating whether media projects have good design, in Design Lab, we use the CAT principles. C is for conceptual. What's your main idea or your main argument? And who is the audience that you're trying to speak to? A is for aesthetics. What's the look or style of your work? Do the colors, font, contrast, structure support your ideas? Are your choices consistent and coherent? Do they speak to your specific audience? And finally, the T is for technical. Are you using your tools well to support your aesthetic and concept? So let's begin with our concept. Building a video can often feel daunting between writing, recording visuals and audio and editing. It can be difficult to know where to start. Breaking your thoughts down into manageable pieces will allow you to tackle one portion of your video at a time and build an organizational structure to adhere to. One place to start is to simply spend some time looking at the kinds of videos that you would like your video to look like. You can find many videos on various social media platforms to see what others are doing. What kind of imagery do they use? What kind of content? What about text or captions? You can draw inspiration from what you see around you. Once you have some ideas, try mind mapping to find logical, emotional, or topical connections between them. Be creative here and try not to edit too much. Just see what ideas come out. After you've mapped out your key ideas, try creating a storyboard to start placing them in chronological order. Don't feel that you need to be great at drawing to create a storyboard. Stick figures are totally fine here. It's simply a way to lay out your ideas so that you can think about the order and easily make changes. First, consider who is your audience? This will tell you how formal your video should be and dictate the style of cinematography and editing required. Once you identify your audience, you can begin to think about how to appeal to them through your video. This means being reflective about visual communication and design. What does your audience like? What kind of visuals will speak to them? This is something we'll talk about today. So visual communication is part of the aesthetic element of our CAT acronym. This has to do with the unified design that you create in your video. We can break aesthetic down into three components that you'll work on. First, we have visuals. Visuals include shot footage, found footage, still images or graphics that are incorporated into a video. Next, we have sound. Sound is often ignored, but it's an essential part of your video. Bad sound means no movie. Don't neglect sound. And finally, editing. While it's the final step of making the video, it's a good idea to think about the final product while you're filming. Before you shoot your video, ask yourself, do I need a shot of X in order to demonstrate the concept Y? Writing up a shot list or your storyboard will help you make sure that you have what you need once you begin to edit. But we'll talk about editing a bit later on. So let's start with the visual. Note the small easel in the bottom left corner. This lets you know that we're thinking about visual elements of your filming. In the visual section, we'll cover orientation, focus, shot scale, composition, lighting, and white balance. When you're filming, the first thing to consider is what kind of aspect ratio and orientation you will choose. Notice how the orientation you choose changes what is visible within your frame and thus what your frame will convey to the viewer. Even though I've edited these from the exact same image, notice that in the landscape shot, we cannot see the subject's hands, and there is more focus on the table behind her. In the square shot, we start to see a bit of the surface where her arms are resting and the pen in her hands, and there is less focus on the background table. In the portrait shot, the surface in the foreground and the objects on it become a really important part of the story. We can also now see the windows behind her. 
which you choose depends on what equipment you're using, how you want to compose figures and objects in the frame, and especially what you plan to do with the video. If you're filming something professionally, or for a more formal situation, you're going to want to use a landscape orientation, since landscape is standard in the industry. In many cases today, we see videos that use a portrait orientation. These are especially popular on social media platforms. And that's because our phones are vertical, or at least we usually hold them vertically to film. And one of the reasons this works so well is because it allows us to capture figures, people, really well, as well as other kinds of subjects that are oriented vertically. So when you're thinking about how to orient your shot, consider both the final platform that you intend to use, as well as what sort of things you want to capture within the frame. Next is focus. What's the difference between these two shots? Right, the focus changes places. In the first shot, the focus is on the rose in the foreground, while the figure in the background is a bit blurred. While in the second shot, the opposite is true. Notice that focus here is telling the viewer what's most important in the image. In the first shot, we know that the flower is more important because it's what's in focus. This is what our eye will be drawn to. In the second, it's the woman because our eyes will be drawn to her first. This helps you communicate with your viewer about what they should pay attention to. The method of achieving focus depends on the camera that you're using, a cell phone versus a digital camera versus a DSLR. But the main task here is to get crisp focus on the most important object or person in your frame. An easy trick for checking focus is to simply zoom in on your subject, subject's eyes, since this is the most communicative part of a person's face. Make sure that the eyes are clear when you zoom in, and then zoom back out to your chosen framing. This will ensure that your subject is perfectly in focus. Next, we have shot scale, which is a major aspect of video communication. Shot scale conveys meaning about the subject and their surroundings. Consider this a long shot in which of the full figure is included in the frame. And that's compared to a medium long shot in which a person is typically shot from about the knees up, filling up most of the screen. When we crop this image to the medium scale, all of a sudden we start to see some kind of relationship between these two individuals. Here we have a medium close-up, which is a person's head and chest filling most of the screen. Here we don't see that this figure is looking at someone else. Instead, she appears to be individually engaging in outdoor recreation, perhaps something like running, and we can still just barely make out that she's likely in a public place. A close-up often frames a person's head. Here we become more focused on her inner personality because we see less of her surroundings. In fact, in this image, we can hardly make out the surroundings at all. On an extreme close-up, small objects or a certain part of the body fills most of the screen. Notice that here, because I've cropped this image from the original long shot, even though it's a high quality image, it's starting to become grainy. This is something to watch out for when you're cropping photos. Remember that it's always better to capture the shot you want as you're taking them so that you can get the highest quality. But what do these shot scales tell us? Well, in this instance, the long shot indicates to us that the group's surroundings are important. We can see that they're walking through a park in fall, that park is in a city, the three appear to be engaged in an ongoing conversation with one another. In the portrait style shot, we have a man who appears to be traveling, perhaps walking to catch a train or a plane, which we can tell by his surroundings and the suitcase that he's carrying. We don't get all these additional details in other kinds of shots. So again, here in our extreme close-up, it conveys many fewer details about surroundings. Instead, it invites us to be curious about the subject's inner thoughts on the left, and particularly what the subject is holding on the right. A safe shot scale for interviews and general filming is the medium or medium close-up shot. These are comfortable scales because they're similar to the way we normally interact with others. 
It provides you with sufficient detail while also giving you a bit of information about the surroundings. Another tip to framing your subjects is known as the rule of thirds. When you set up your shots using the intersections of thirds lines to position your subjects. Here the man's face is the most important element in the frame, so the photographer has placed him in the upper left hand intersection of thirds lines. Although we often talk about the rule of thirds in terms of landscape oriented photos, it also works for portrait photos as you can see here. Some of the most engaging parts of the photos are arranged at approximately the intersection of thirds lines. And of course, it also works for square. Remember that there are built in grid lines on most phones that you can turn on in the settings. These will not show up in the final image, but they will help you create an interesting and engaging shot. By attending to thirds lines, you can avoid the common mistake of giving your subject too much or too little headroom, which you can see in the examples here on the left and right. Instead, you want to go for just the right amount of headroom, which you can see demonstrated in the central center picture. With a slight reframing using our rule of thirds, we can improve this even more, eliminating any awkwardness in the headroom and creating a pleasing composition. And here's that image without the third lines marked. In most cases, your subject will not be directly addressing the camera or audience, so you'll shoot them at about this scale. But something probably seems a bit off about this picture, and that's to do with lead or nose room. There's not enough lead room in this image. The figure is kind of squished up against the side of the frame. Here it's getting a bit better because they're centered in the frame, but we can still make this more pleasing. Now it's perfect. We have the figure in the frame with enough lead or nose room. You can imagine a comic book image with a speech bubble placed in front of the character's mouth. That's about how much room you should be leaving in the direction that your subject is facing. And don't forget about this in portrait and square orientations as well. So here we can see that lead room applies in both of these images. Now let's talk about lighting. Your subject's face is the most important communication tool, so you want to be sure that it's well lit. Filming a person against a bright window, for example, will cast them into shadow and prevent the viewer from seeing them properly. When you shoot indoors, try to establish what's known as a three-point lighting setup. You have your key light, fill light, and backlight. The key light is typically the brightest light on your subject. Notice, however, when we have only the key light, a dark shadow is created on the other side of the figure. When we add a backlight, it helps to separate the subject from their background, but we still have some shadows that we might want to address. When we include a fill light, it helps balance out the shadows created by the key and backlights, while also illuminating the other side of the person's face. Now the face is well lit. Setting up a full three-point lighting arrangement may seem daunting, but be aware that you can use household lamps and natural light from windows to accomplish this. Your standard desk lamp or floor lamp, for example, can serve as a useful spotlight. And don't be afraid to include some shadow at times. This can greatly enhance the emotion you're trying to convey. Just be sure that when you do so, it's intentional and you make the decision to add or remove light to achieve a certain look. Let's talk briefly about white balance. White balance is used to adjust colors to match the color of the light source so that objects appear white. It's best to aim for a neutral color temperature, as in the center picture, where white appear, whites appear as true whites. That is, they match the color that you perceive with your eyes in the specific location where you're shooting. You can use a piece of paper to test your white balance before shooting. If you want to go for a cooler or warmer temperature, you're better off doing this in the editing process in case you change your mind later on. 
In other words, it's much easier to make a change from neutral than to go from warm or cool back to neutral. So when you're shooting your video, be mindful of the elements of orientation, focus, shot scale, composition, lighting, and white balance. Now let's move on to sound. The number one issue for amateur sound recordists is not listening for potentially destructing or damaging sounds. Wind, electronic buzzing, or echoes are just a few types of noises that you'll want to be aware of. Beware of recording in locations like this. This is the terrace at UW-Madison Memorial Union, and it's a gorgeous place, but it's full of wind, noises, and conversation. These will all be picked up by your microphone. Similarly, avoid locations with electric interference that can cause hissing or buzzing. Or if you do decide to record in a location that may have interference, try to remember to unplug or turn off those noise sources. For example, if you're in a space like a kitchen, be sure to turn off the refrigerator. These can be more noisy than you think. Finally, be sure to avoid wearing jewelry or clothes that may make noise. Now I want to briefly touch on the last consideration of the cat of effective design, and that's the technical. Don't overthink what equipment you use. Instead, go for the simplest solutions and what you're most comfortable with. For most folks, this may mean recording using your phone. If you decide to shoot with your phone, here are a few tips. First, enter airplane mode. Try to use your rear camera, your selfie camera is often of lower quality. Be sure to fill the frame fully with your subject. It's often better to move closer to your subject instead of using the, digi the digital zoom. Try to avoid flash. Instead, try natural or three-point lighting setups. Use a simple and uncluttered background. And always try some test shots first. A final tip is to make sure that you always use some form of stabilization for your camera. This might mean using a traditional tripod, but you can also use various DIY methods like stacked books, tables and chairs, and even small items like Legos or hair clips can help you to stabilize your camera. You can also use a small, a small portable tripod, which often have attachments for smartphones. Or you can simply use your own body by resting your elbows on a table in order to make sure you're holding your device still.